think perhaps the best way is to get started by um, by starting to read the text. Thus have I heard. On one occasion the Blessed One was living at Savathi in Jetta's Grove and at Abindika's Park, where the Venerable Sariputta addressed the bhikkhus thus. So, sorry, just to break it. Thus have I heard. This is the standard beginning to the suttas and is the statement made by Venerable Ananda at the first council when he was asked to recite to the council all of the Buddha's sermons. He had the gift of a perfect memory and it was to him that everybody turned to ask him about what the Buddha said. And so when he says, thus have I heard, I means Ananda. This is what I, Ananda, heard the Buddha say. And he was staying, the, the Buddha was staying in um, a place which had been given to him by Anasa Pindaka, who was the hugely wealthy and hugely generous benefactor. He was the, the Bill Gates of the day. And he had found a grove of trees where he would which he thought would be suitable for him to give the Buddha. But it was owned by a Prince Jeta. So Anasa Pindaka had to do a deal with Jeta to buy from him the grove. Legend has it that the amount he paid was in gold coins sufficient gold coins to cover the whole of the grove in gold coins. <coughs> so this is where the, the sutta starts and as, we, as I said earlier, this is where in fact it is Sariputta who does the talking, not the Buddha himself. Thank you. One of right view one of right view is said, friends, in what way is a noble disciple one of right view, whose view is straight, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at his true Dhamma? Indeed, friend, you would come from far away to learn from the Venerable Saraputta the meaning of this statement. It would be good if the Venerable Saraputta would explain the meaning of this statement. Having heard it from him, the bhikkhus will remember it. Bhikkhus, by the way, is the term for a monk. It means literally someone who <coughs> uh, relies on others for his gift of the food that he eats. He, he's a mendicant. Uh, that is the term bhikkhu. Then friends, listen and closely attend to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the bhikkhus replied. The Venerable Sariputta said this. When, friends, the noble disciple understands the unwholesome, the root of the unwholesome, the wholesome and the root of the wholesome, in that way he is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma. The um, word for the roots of the unwholesome are loba, dosa, and moha. These three are the fundamental defilements which we have in our minds. <coughs> Until enlightenment is reached, everyone, to a greater or lesser extent, has 
loba dosa moha in the mind. Loba is greed or attachment, wanting things. Dosa is the opposite. It's revulsion, it's aversion. Loba wants to hang on to things. Dosa wants to get rid of things because we don't like them. So it's hatred. And underlying both of those <coughs> is ignorance or moha. It is because we have ignorance that we also have loba and dosa. If there was no ignorance, there would be no loba and no dosa. So um, loba and dosa cannot be found together because they are they're opposite, they contradict each other. But they both have to go with uh, moha. So uh, loba and moha, dosa and moha, or just moha alone, just pure ignorance. So those are the root defilements which we all have to a greater or lesser extent. The difference between us is simply one of degree. It's not that people don't have these qualities. They are all buried in our minds, some at a shallow level, some at a more profound level, but they will not be eliminated until enlightenment is reached. So all the other unskillful states of mind come from these three. You can think of them like the three primary colors. You mix together the three primary colors in different degrees and you get any other color. In a similar way, these three root defilements are there and make up other unskillful states of mind. Yes, go ahead. Anusaya, Anusaya is um, it's called an underlying tendency. It means literally uh, to, to sleep along with. And they are buried deep in the mind. And they can surface from time to time when the conditions are right. So they're not as powerful as loba and dosa and moha, but they are qualities which lurk in the mind, ready to pop up if they have the right conditions to allow them. Yes, I can. There are, uh, first of all, the sense desire or greed, um, called karma raga. Then um, aversion, patiga. Speculative opinions, diti. If you just find the word diti, as distinct from samaditi, diti by itself refers to wrong views, speculative views. <coughs> samaditi, of course, is the opposite. Then we have doubt, skeptical doubt, diti teacher, pride or conceit, mana, uh, desire for continued existence, that's bhava, raga and ignorance, avidya. So actually you're getting some of these words popping up in one or more, uh, in two different or more categories. So you've got ignorance as, as, as uh, moha, and here as an underlying tendency you've got avidya, and avidya and moha are actually synonyms for the same state. So if we look at these um, these unwholesome um, 
situation. Uh, the, the, there are three levels. There's the psychologically unhealthy or unwholesome state where the mind is contaminated with these defiling qualities. Um, and then there are uh, the aspect of, of our actions which are open to criticism, to censure, what is morally blameworthy. And then thirdly, there is the form of action which produces uh, bad karmic results. So, um, akusala is everything which leads us away from the attainment of Nibbāna. Whereas kusala is the opposite, that leads us towards the attainment of <coughs> Nibbāna. And um, Sorry, I've, I've, used the pl I've lost my copy. I've given it to you. What, what, what paragraph number have we got to? We're in number four, and I start okay. Being okay, so this is where we have a list of actions which are regarded as unwholesome or unskillful. Please. And what, friends, is the unwholesome? What is the root of the unwholesome? What is the wholesome? What is the root of the wholesome? Killing living beings is unwholesome. Taking what is not given is unwholesome. Misconduct in sensual pleasures is unwholesome. False speech is unwholesome. Malicious speech is unwholesome. Harsh speech is unwholesome. Gossip is unwholesome. We recognise where these come in. Yeah, the five, the five uh, um, precepts. This is. Yeah, but hang on. We've only, we've only. If you look at it, break it down. The, there are actions of body, which are the first three. Then there are four put together as wrong speech. Musavada, when we take the precept to avoid unskillful speech, that comprises lying, backbiting, harsh speech, and gossip. All of those four come under the umbrella of wrong speech. So all of these, all of these so far are covered by the five, sorry, four of the five precepts. And then we come on, lastly, to mental actions. We've had physical actions, we've had verbal actions, and now the last three are mental. And because they're mental, they don't come under the category of precepts. Precepts are only training our body and training our speech, not yet training the mind. Covetousness is unwholesome, ill will is unwholesome, wrong view is unwholesome. This is called the unwholesome. And what is the root of the unwholesome? Greed is the root of the unwholesome. Hate is the root of the unwholesome. Delusion is a root of the unwholesome. This is called the root of the unwholesome. And what is the wholesome? Abstention from killing living beings is wholesome. Abstention from taking what is not given is wholesome. Abstention from misconduct in sensual pleasure is wholesome. Abstention from false speech is wholesome. Abstention from malicious speech is wholesome. Abstention from harsh speech is wholesome. Abstention from gossip is wholesome. Non-covetousness is wholesome. Non-ill will is wholesome. Right view is wholesome. This is called the wholesome. 
And what is the root of the wholesome? Non-greed is a root of the wholesome. Non-hate is a root of the wholesome. Non-delusion is a root of the wholesome. This is called the root of the wholesome. So when it talks about abstention from various activities, uh, we can distinguish three kinds of abstention. The first is what is sometimes called spontaneous or natural abstention. The abstention that comes from our upbringing. We're told as children, don't do this, don't do that. That is a form of abstention, but that's relatively weak. It doesn't always manage to control our actions. So the second form of abstention is precepts. When we make a formal statement, I undertake the precept to avoid killing living beings. That's a more powerful control on our actions. And then the third level of abstention is when the quality is rooted out. As we progress along the, uh, the path to enlightenment, qualities, certain qualities are uprooted, eradicated. So that's the most powerful form of uh, abstention. Well, they may not abstain from them. I mean, there are, as we saw a few minutes ago, the, at least at the time of the Buddha, and probably even today, there are people who don't think it is necessary to abstain from certain actions because they don't accept that our actions have consequences. Some people think it doesn't matter if I if I if I steal this. What, you know, so what? I don't know. You know it's okay, there's nothing wrong in stealing. I, I, I need it, I want it, I'm going to steal it. So they, they just go ahead and steal. There's no, there's no restraint on their actions. So I was thinking of the other way, like there are lots of non-Buddhists yes. who are like vegetarians and yes. they do it because they don't want to kill animals and all Yes, that. yes. But they have not gone and uh, got to the perfect or anything like that, but they just do it because they want to. Well, that, that, is, that is the first form, that, that is natural abstention. I'm not saying that can't work. It, it can work. And you, certainly, you don't have to be a Buddhist in order to lead a moral life. Many, many people, either followers of other religions or followers of no religion, they still lead a moral life. Sometimes better than the Buddhist <laughs> <laughs> You may well be right. Yes, indeed. Indeed. I mean, Buddhists can't claim to be perfect people. They're not. Um, you know, we, we have, as I say, we all have loba, dosa, and moha uh, in our minds. So you know, we, we don't claim to be, to be perfect, and you're, you're perfectly correct that even though we take precepts, mm -hmm. we still break them. So that's why we need to remind ourselves every day the precepts. So, um, yeah, other people can be restrained in their actions even though they don't see it in Buddhist terms, they can still abstain from unskillful actions. So do, do you do any, like, afterlife? Like, so when you die, mm -hmm. you, you have a better life or a bad life, mm -hmm. based on our karma. Mm -hmm. So those things that they do without knowing, is it also karma can be considered as karma? And yes, I, I, I don't think... Um, you know, whether you are a Buddhist or a non-Buddhist, that doesn't mean at least on the level of morality, it's not very important because anybody who refrains from killing living beings is doing a skillful act. Anybody who refrains from uh, taking what is not given is also doing uh, a skillful action. And there are other religions which teach you not to go around stealing other people's property. So the morality is not... B Buddhism doesn't have a mon monopoly on, on a moral way of life. You, you, you can be uh, a follower of another religion or an 
an atheist or an agnostic, you can still act in a way which is considerate of other people and their property. But for the benefit of people who perhaps haven't thought this one out for themselves very well, we're given a ready-made template by the Buddha. He says, look, five precepts. Please try to observe to, uh, to keep these precepts because they are a restraint on your actions. Does that answer the question? Yes, so we got to paragraph eight. When a noble disciple has thus understood the unwholesome, the root of the unwholesome, the wholesome and the root of the wholesome, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit, I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way too, a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at his true Dhamma. Now this is a little text which will be repeated regularly through the sutta and we need to understand uh, what this means. Um, when it says he abandons the underlying tendency to lust and he abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. That is the mark of a stream enterer, a sotapanna, someone who has attained the first of the four stages of enlightenment. Then he extirpates the underlying tendency to view and the conceit I am and abandons ignorance. That is the enlightened being. Sorry, I got that wrong. The first one is not a stream enter, he's a non-returner, he's an anagami. So this description here is describing the last two stages of the attainment of enlightenment. Someone who is either a non-returner or an enlightened being. And then the last part of this little bit of text um, he says in that way to a noble disciple is one of right view whose view is straight he sees things clearly that means he has perfect confidence in the Dhamma that is one of the qualities of the stream enterer, the sotapanna. He has abolished doubts. He has complete confidence in this teaching. He has confidence in the Buddha, confidence in the Dhamma, and confidence in the Sangha. And he keeps the five precepts perfectly. That is the stream enterer, the sotapanna. So we've got uh, the two degrees of attainment <coughs> described in this paragraph. He has arrived at this true Dhamma uh, that is the right view. This is this is the the sotapanna. So I, I, is that clear that this this text here is describing the attainment of um, 
non-returner or arahant followed by the attainment of the sotapanna, the stream enterer. The once returner is not mentioned here because he doesn't eradicate any uh, of the of the ten fetters. He he reduces them but doesn't eradicate. What question? Yeah. So then the the type of understanding that is meant to is like uh, vipassana type understanding, not intellectual understanding of the the ten rules of the the ten types of wholesome and unwholesome acts. Right? Well, th there are two levels of understanding. We, we start with an intellectual understanding, which is what we call mundane, or lokiya, which is what you saw on that little chart. The first section, the top section, was <coughs> mundane understanding. You understand the Four Noble Truths intellectually, and that's very valuable. You, you understand the doctrine of karma. But it's not yet direct experience. When your understanding becomes deeper through following the Noble Eightfold Path, yes, Vipassana meditation, but also other factors of the path, by following and perfecting the, the other factors in the Noble Eightfold Path, then we reach the supramundane, Lokuttara. So you've got these two levels of right view. You've got the preliminary right view, which comes at the beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path, and then you've got the ultimate right view, which marks the end of the Eightfold Path. So right view comes at the both, both at the beginning and at the end of the path. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first one is, or the second one is when you do meditation and things like that? Yes, but it is, it, is the, it is the result of practicing the whole of the Noble Eightfold Path. It's not just meditation, it is the practice of all eight factors which leads to enlightenment. You know, the Buddha said there are eight factors in the path to attain enlightenment. So we have to practice them all, not just, we can't just take one out. We need to practice all eight. But if we practice them successfully, then that is the result is enlightenment, which is the, the supramundane level of right view. But to begin with, we only have the mundane level, which is an intellectual understanding. We can read or listen to somebody talking about the Four Noble Truths. And we can reflect on that, we can deepen our understanding by thinking about it, by having a discussion, by talking and uh, uh, expressing opinions and asking other people their views. But it's, at the moment it's still an elementary level of, uh, of understanding. Yes, direct experience is the supermundane level, when we translate an intellectual understanding to direct experience. That's the two levels. Shall we make a tea break here? <laughs>